I want to welcome all of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the Divine Hour. We are delighted that you could join us for this worship service. And I pray that we would be blessed as we listen to God's servant, Dr. Arnold Robin, as he brings the message from the throne of God. I pray that we all would be drawn closer to Jesus and have a clear understanding of his word and his will. Let's pray. Our holy and gracious God, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for everyone who has joined, Lord. We have come to find that sweet rest in Jesus. And may the Holy Spirit draw us closer to God and to his word. As we listen to your manservant, Dr. Robin, I pray, Father, that you will anoint his lips, that the words of his mouth might come from you, O Lord, and draw us close to you and help us to be blessed at the end of the message, to go with joy and praising God for the word. Continue to be with all of us and the final herald ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, and thank you once again for making the choice to be with us as we come to the Lord together as one family. Truly, the Bible tells us, friends, it is of his mercies that we are not consumed. And we thank God for allowing us and affording us his mercies, his grace, and his matchless love that has brought us thus far and gives us any hope of seeing another tomorrow. We want to thank God for his mighty presence, his great and just priceless faithfulness, his unbending commitment to us to give us victory like we've never known before. We thank God for another opportunity to study and pray and to worship the Lord together. Our study today is entitled Preparing for the end, preparing for the end. Let us pray as we go right into God's word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for calling us yours. Not even in the times when we behave like it, but because we are a people that are owned by the Lord. 
thank you so much for this great honor and privilege to be in your presence. Thank you for the assurance and the promise you've made that the good work you start, you will bring to a finish. And we thank you, Father, for you have made it possible for us to be able to stand in the time of calamity, disasters, and utmost mayhem if we learn to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Thank you so much for what you are teaching us day after day. And we pray, God, that as we commune together, we pray that this convocation would be one that brings God joy, that fills his heart with gladness, and that it is a communion that truly builds us and prepares us to be with the Lord eternally. Thank you, Father, for what you have in store for us today. Please speak and set us free. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome once again, friends, and I want to thank God for allowing us the precious privileges, the repeated opportunities to be able to be in his presence. We serve a faithful Savior. Life, I believe, is a testimony of it. The fact that we have made it thus far, the fact that we're all even alive, part of this study is a testimony to the power of God to save, to redeem, and to rescue people. I want to begin by asking, have there been times in the past when you thought this was the end? When you came to a certain circumstance in your life, a certain dilemma, a certain crisis, a certain deep, perilous experience where you thought, this is it. I'm not going to make it through this. And as you thought of that time, and as you reminisce of that time now, you're looking back and, and realizing what I thought was the end. God has brought me through it. And I stand today being able to declare that God is indeed faithful. God is indeed faithful. But friends, there is a real end that's ahead of us. There is a real end that's right ahead. And God in his word realizes that end is very near and, and what's so amazing you'd be amazed friends across scripture god repeatedly builds and builds and builds revealing to god's people that the end is near and in order to prepare for this time there are passages after passages that reveal to us just how that end will look like and it's, it's really, really powerful, friends, because these are passages that demand our attention. And one would not be prepared, one would not be prepared if we've not been paying attention to these special passages that God gives to us repeatedly to be able to help us to be found standing when the time comes. Yesterday, we looked at that beautiful text that says, having done all, having done all, we should be found standing, having done all to be able to stand. Now, friends, one of the things that's really, really beautiful to observe through Scripture is that God sees the time of the end that's ahead. And so we read God's counsel, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, watch unto prayer. We've looked at that text before. Be ye sober, do not be influenced. Do not let your mind be under the delusion of some drug, some effect, some scenario, some circumstance, some pressure of life, but rather watch unto prayer. Watch unto prayer. The end of all things is at hand. God sees how near we are. And friends, as a result, he's demanding that our attention go back to precious passages in Scripture that reveal to us 
just how soon that end is going to be. And so friends, I'd like, I'd like you to go with me on a journey, on a journey through some selected passages from the book of Isaiah. And we're going to go through them. We're going to start picking them up today. And, and for the next few days, we're going to take a look at certain passages in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to see how all of these passages actually speak about the end. And, and you'd actually be amazed if you catch the pattern, you will see it repeat itself again and again and again in scripture. Oh, the Bible specifically, like the Old Testament speaks so much about it. We traverse over into the New Testament and again, it speaks abundantly about this very specific time, the chronology of events. And it tells us God is giving to us all of this instruction because he does not want us to be caught unaware. He wants us to be doing all to be able to stand in the time of the end. We're going to begin with Isaiah chapter 1 and notice what the Bible says. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And this is the word that came to Isaiah. It says, hear, O heavens. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord had spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, we realize, friends, that this word is coming to Isaiah in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, these are kings of Judah. And the message is, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. The Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, but they've rebelled against me. Hmm. Jeremiah starts his message on a, on a similar tone. We read about it in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 12. Notice the, notice the similarity in the presentation of thought. Jeremiah 2 verse 12, the Bible says, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Interesting. Notice what God is saying in the opening statement. In the opening statement to Judah, to Jerusalem, to God's people, God says, these are a people who I have nourished, I have brought up, I have brought out, but they are a people who have rebelled against me. In verse 3, a passage we've looked at in the past, the, the Lord says, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know my people doth not consider. Wow. In a similar thought, Jeremiah speaks on a similar line. It's very interesting. You could read about it in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 7. Notice what Jeremiah says, joining on the same thought. Jeremiah 8 verse 7, the Bible says, Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. And the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. The turtle, the crane, and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord? This is serious. This is serious. You see, friends, the people do not know how near they are to the end. They do not see that the judgments of God are going to be poured out. That's because they don't know the judgments of the Lord because they have not known the Lord. I hope this is coming across. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people does not consider. And it's powerful, friends, because in Isaiah 1, 3, what the, what the Lord is saying is that Israel does not know. The ox knows his owner. The ass knows his master's crib, but Israel does not know its owner. And the thing about what is being said there is that God is saying Israel does not know. 
Now, the thing about that word is that it is a deep word, which we've looked at in the past. You could look it up for yourself in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, where the Bible tells us Adam knew Eve, his wife, and a child is born. That word for knowing, as Adam knows his wife and a child is born, that intimacy between a husband and a wife within the realm of that marital fabric and framework, we see that that intimacy God picks up as a knowing relationship between himself and his people. My people do not know me. The word in the Hebrew is the word yada. My people don't yada me. They're not close to me. They're not intimate with me. My people do not consider. Oh, my people do not consider. Mm. Jeremiah speaking on the same tone. I, I mean, I'm telling you, friends, this, these thoughts are scattered across Scripture because God is saying something to us about what's coming. And Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 9 and verse 3, says the same thing. Jeremiah 9, 3 says, And they bend their tongues like their bow, for lies. They are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. In fact, in Jeremiah 9 and verse 6, the Bible goes on to say, Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit, through deceit, they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Now, friends, that's the question of Scripture. The question of Scripture is, are you taking time to really get to yada with your Lord, guarding your devotional life, doing all to be able to Stay close in, in intimacy with your Savior. We studied yesterday how Daniel loved his communion moment with the Lord, even if that meant death. Even if that meant I would have to pay it with my life, as was the case of Naboth. Naboth said, I will stand up for the Lord, even if I had to pay it with my life. Friends, God is looking, and, and, and make no mistakes, friends, Isaiah 1 is indeed a chapter for the time of the end. You're going to find out soon, pretty soon, why that is so. And in speaking about the time of the end, God is saying there will have to be a people who need to know me. One, 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 one passage that really stands out to me on that note is found in Daniel 11. Oh, and when I say that, some people's ears go up. It's like, whoa, did he, he just said Daniel 11. Uh, th that passage, that passage, oh, that's a, that's a profound, that's a deep passage. Uh, wait, what, what sort of last day instruction are we going to receive from Daniel 11? And friends, you realize in Daniel 11 and verse 32, in the thick of of, of the storm, notice what God says in Daniel 11, verse 32. The Bible says, such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries. And so there's an, there's an end time power that's going out and it's attacking God's, the, those people you know, doing wickedly, they are being taken over, they're being corrupted by flatteries. But then Daniel eleven thirty two says, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I really like that. The Bible says, those who know their God. Again, I just took you to an end time passage, Daniel 11, and it says the same thing, that those individuals who really know their God, Yada, their master, they will do great exploits in the time of the end. Are you just a passing through, dear friends? Or are you a people through whom God will do great exploits in the time of the end? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 4, A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, a children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. 
They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Let's, let's break down this passage and see how this passage builds itself up. It's important for us to understand what the passage is actually saying. Let's, let's repeat this. It says, our sinful nation. It is a people that's laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. They are children that are corruptors. And then it says, you know, this is its condition. You know why? Because they've forsaken the Lord. Ah, uh, you've got to listen to me very carefully, friends. It says it has become a sinful nation. It has become a people laden with iniquity. It has become a seed of evildoers, a children that are corruptors for one simple reason. This has happened because they have forsaken the Lord. Now, friends, this is important to understand that sin has now become like a heavy laden burden on their back. Sin has corrupted them. Sin has made even their children evildoers, a seed of evildoers. The nation, sin has become a national declaration. It has become a sinful nation. Just as today, perhaps you may look at some area and call them COVID areas. And if we don't, if, we, if, if, if we're not careful enough, there's the danger of some nations being declared as COVID nations. The pandemic of sin had taken over God's people. Now, friends, you see, the, the result of this pandemic was the fact that they had forsaken the Lord. Someone says, wait, what does that mean? What that means is, friends, if you look at the word forsaken, when you look at the word forsaken in the original Hebrew, the word forsaken means to loosen. The word forsaken means to loosen. What does that mean? What that means is, friends, they had loosened their grip upon the Lord. They did not hold on to the Lord. Friends, they did not do their all to be able to stand. They let go of the Lord when things got rough, when the finances got challenging, when the sickness crept in, when some crisis happened in the home, when the marriage threatened to fall apart, they let go of the Lord when they should have been holding on to the Lord. They have forsaken the Lord. They have loosened their grip on the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we are in the danger of becoming a sinful people. We are in the danger of becoming a family laden with iniquity. Our children are in the danger of becoming children who are evil doers, children that are corruptors. Friends, all of this is a declaration to our lives if we forsake, if we loosen our grip on the Lord. In the book Reflecting Christ, page 106 in paragraph 4, you read this powerful statement. Sin not only shuts us away from God, but destroys in the human soul both the desire and the capacity for knowing him. This is deep. This is deep. Sin not only shuts us away from God, but if you keep cherishing sin, dear friend, it will destroy in you not just the desire, it will destroy in you even the capacity to know God. Truth be told, friends, you cannot safely harbor sin in your heart. Because as you go out after sin, having lost your grip on the Lord, sin will not only not shut you away from God, sin will not only not corrupt the desire, and you don't even feel like knowing God, the reality is you will lose your capacity to know God. That's a warning, dear friends. That's a warning that comes our way, preparing for the end. The Lord says, if you want to be found standing at the time of the end, you have got to be a people who have learned to hold on to the Lord. Stubbornly, persistently, like Jacob in Genesis 32, declaring to the Lord, I am not going to let you go until you bless me. You see, friends, Jacob wasn't asking, Lord, you have to bless me with money. You have to bless me with land. You have to bless me with wealth. Lord, I need your blessing. He, he wanted God. He wanted God. For God, if you're with me, I have all I need. 
I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not losing my grip on you, Lord. I am not losing my grip on you. You see, dear brothers and sisters, God is looking for just such a people. It is such a people who will be found standing in the end. For they have done their all to make sure their grip is never loosened from the Lord. Isaiah 1 verse 5, the Bible says now, we're transitioning now. The Lord says, why should you be stricken anymore? Now pay attention. Why should you be stricken anymore? We're going to study more of this. We're going to study more of this when we get to Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm going to refer back to this passage. We find in Isaiah chapter 1, the Lord says, why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Now notice this, speaking about the time of the end, as iniquity increases, as iniquity increases, God's judgment comes upon an iniquity-laden people. We're told, friends, that the places today that you can identify with the extremes of sin are particularly the cities. Where sin has reached in its extreme, and the Lord declares, why would you be stricken? He's speaking of a time, why would you receive the striking of the Lord? Why would you receive the smiting of God's judgment upon you? Why would you be stricken like this? Why will you revolt more and more when you see that your sin is only bringing down God's judgments upon you? The whole head is sick. The whole head is sick. Your head is not in the right place. Why would you bring this up? Think about it, friends. Think about it. Why would you keep going down the path? The, the head is sick. If you keep going down the path, you know leads to death. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with the head. There's something wrong. Why would you walk down the path that you know means everlasting death? Why would you go down that path? Knowing that this path leads to death and you still walk on it? Friends, that, th th that's a question on sanity. That raises questions on one's sanity. Well, why, why, why would they do that? You know, it's, it's, it's easy, friends. You know, you walk in the streets and you see somebody drinking alcohol and, and, and you, know, you can almost be resentfully saying, now, why would they drug themselves like that? Why would they kill themselves like that? You see someone smoking and you see someone chewing tobacco and you say, now, why would, they be, why would they be breathing such poison? Why would they be chewing such poison? Although so quick to judge somebody out there, but not questioning the fact how we chew on sin. How we breathe in the miasma of, of, of corruption and iniquity. How we drink in hatred and pride and evil and resentment. Why would you be stricken anymore? So friends, notice, notice what's, what's happening. A people who have loosened their grip, they did not do their all to stand. This is serious stuff. A people who did not hold on to the Lord lost their grips, increased in iniquity. God's judgments are poured upon. And as God's judgments are poured upon, we read in Isaiah 1 and verse 7, the Bible says, Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers, devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Wait a minute. What? Your country is desolate. Your cities, notice that, notice that. We just said it, we just talked about this. Friends, this is across the board. The Lord gives this to, gives this to us across the table. Now notice, friends, this is not speaking about a, a universal situation. This is not speaking about a worldwide destruction. It's speaking specifically about cities. In the context of the end, this is speaking about that, that destruction that will come upon the cities primarily before the, the great destruction that is going to come 
upon the world, the, 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 the great time of trouble. The seven, the seven last plagues, we are reading that this is not that time. This is not that time. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. And specifically the cities. Cities are burned with fire. Your land. Strangers devour it in your presence. It is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And we, we find that, friends, across Scripture, Again and again, the Bible actually speaks of this time. It speaks of the time when God comes out and his destruction follows. We read about it, in, for instance, in Zephaniah 1. You would, you would remember this. When we looked at Zephaniah, I guess in the message called, Are You Covered? If you remember in Zephaniah 1, and verse 16, the, the Bible says, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. The Zephaniah 115 says the, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Friends, this is what we're bringing upon ourselves. This is what the cities of the world are bringing upon themselves as they do not cling on to the Lord. Do not get to know the Lord. They've forsaken the Lord. They've become an iniquity-laden people. And as unrighteousness and wickedness increases in them, God says, I will destroy. I will destroy with fire. I will destroy with fire. Very interesting. Very interesting. Notice where else, notice where else the Lord, the Lord speaks about this. So it's really, really amazing. And let us see, let us see. Where else does the Lord pick up this, this, this similar language? Uh, notice in Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah speaks about it as well. Jeremiah 17 and verse 27. This is powerful now. But if you will not hearken unto me, this is Jeremiah 17, 27. If you will not hearken unto me, to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof. It shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. Very interesting. The God said this is going to be the judgment as the world forsakes the law of God. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible says, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, the gates thereof are burned with fire. Jeremiah 51 speaks about the time when the, when the Bible says, The broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken, and her high gates shall be burned with fire. Hmm. Friends, the... The Bible says this is a time that is ahead of us. And we read in Isaiah 1 and verse 8 that the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard. That's, the, that's, that's, what, that's what has happened of God's people. They're left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. What do we find? God's people are left they're left in a, in, in, in a time in a time when they, they are left with just a meager. They're left with a very meager settlement. Friends, this is powerful. This is, these are all pictures of the end. As God's destructions come upon the cities, God's people will move like a cottage in a vineyard. Oh. That the people of God will be left as a cottage in a vineyard, that meager settlement, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers. But notice it doesn't stop there. Isaiah 1 verse 9 says, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Oh, we go back. God says there are people who, these are people who don't know me. But then, friends, in the middle, in the thick of the land, there were a people, 
in the midst of such a broken society, the Bible says there were indeed a people who the Bible describes as a very small remnant. And the Bible says it is the Lord who has left us a very small remnant. And if this remnant had not been there, we would have been destroyed like Sodom. We should have been like unto Gomorrah. And friends, I want to highlight before you and let you know that while destruction came upon and the wicked were destroyed, guess what? God had saved, had preserved the righteous. You see, friends, as God's judgments came upon, they were not to destroy all. They sifted out the sinners. They sifted out those who would not persevere in holding on to the Lord, those who would not persevere in doing their all to be able to stand. They're purged out, and a very small remnant is left. And what's powerful about Isaiah 1-9 is, friends, that we are given a revelation that it is because of this remnant that the land has not received destruction like Sodom and Gomorrah. Would you believe me? Would you believe me and would you believe God's word when it says it is because of these certain individuals that total wipe-out destruction has not happened? Hmm... God has held back the winds. God has held back destruction because of the small remnant who are interceding. And, and they're not afraid of destruction. That's not what they're afraid of. Their plea for God to hold back destruction for a while is so that they can do more work. God hold back uh, destruction for a while so that more people can be saved and brought into the truth. A small remnant. I guess my question at this point is, are you part of that small remnant? Are you a part of that group? Are you a part of that people who are found pleading with the Lord? Are you part of that group that is out there finishing the work? Are you part of people who are pleading with God to hold back destruction so that a still a few more people can get to know the Lord. This is important. Interestingly, somebody asked, but wait, what are the remnant doing? Good question. Verse 10 tells us what they're doing. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Oh, that's interesting. So notice, let's rewind. There is a, a, a nation that's laden with iniquity. As a result of their great sins, God's judgments are upon them. Now, the cities are destroyed with fire, but we realize there is a remnant that's left. And it is this remnant that is doing, that's pleading with God, that is going out to God. They have yada their Lord. And as a result, God has enabled them. Now notice this, in the midst of the destruction, in the midst of the destruction, notice what these remnant are doing. They're going out and saying, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Notice what they're doing. They're going out, speaking to those in Sodom who've never heard the truth. Prophecy students would call it giving the loud cry. Now notice, friends, while judgment is on the cities, this is very important to understand. While judgment is upon the cities, God's mercy is still pleading with individuals. This in itself tells you this is not the seven last plagues. This is not the this is not describing Isaiah 1, a local picture, is telling us, a, giving us an end time picture of just how it will be in the time of the end. We're told, hear the word of the Lord. These people, these remnant who have yada the Lord, who have really gotten intimate with the Lord and gotten in a deep relationship with the Lord, as a result, something has happened that has empowered them to go to Sodom and appeal to them to pay attention to the law of God. 
Now that's interesting. Someone's saying, what has happened? Well, to find out, come with me to the book of Joel. Joel chapter two, and we wanna find out, wait, what has given the impetus to go out and give this final message, to go out and give this final warning, to come out of this confusion, to come out of such a brokenness, to come out of such wickedness. Come with me to Joel chapter two. And notice what the Bible says about the time of the end. And it speaks about the time when God is going to be doing a special work for his people. A work that will prepare the people of God to be doing a final work. Now in Joel chapter 2, we are very familiar with the words found in verse 29. Joel 2, 29 tells us also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. So notice what God says. He's saying that I am going to be pouring out my Holy Spirit. It is going to be that time when God will pour out his, his Holy Spirit in great measure. We've seen God pour out his spirit, Acts chapter 2, as he pours out that early rain experience, we like to call it. But from Hosea 6, we know God said there's going to be a latter rain. There's going to be a second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we find that, friends, we read in Joel 2 that as God will pour out his spirit, notice what will take place along that same season. While God is pouring out his spirit upon his people, what else will be taking place? Verse 30 says this to us, Joel 2 and verse 30. The Bible says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Did you listen to what God said? God says, while the spirit of God is going to be poured out, it will also be a time when God says, I will show signs. There will, be, uh, there will be blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Hmm. That's interesting. There'll be blood, there'll be fire, there'll be pillars of smoke. This is interesting. And, and, and rather, friends, come with me to Acts chapter 2, and, and, and notice how this passage ties in. When, when the Holy Spirit is outpoured in Acts chapter 2, the, the Pentecostal experience, as they receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, notice what happens when Peter stands up. What is this? What is this? Uh, you know, they're asking, wait, wait, what does this mean? Acts chapter 2 verse 12, they're all amazed. They're in doubt saying one to another, what meaneth this? They, 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 don't, they, they can't make sense of it. So Acts chapter 2 verse 14, Peter stands up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Oh, that's interesting. Now notice Peter in trying to explain what has just taken place in Acts chapter 2 at the outpouring of the Spirit, notice which passage he's going to quote from Joel. And, he, and I read here, it says in verse 18, on my servants and on my handmaidens, Acts 2, 18, on the, my servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my Spirit and they shall prophesy. Very interesting. I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Verse 19 says, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood, fire, vapors of smoke. That is interesting. In other words, as God says, I will pour out my spirit. It is also going to be a time of destruction. Perhaps some of you are familiar. You've seen this when a certain place is, 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 is destroyed with fire. You see that the smoke goes up in forming a pillar into the sky, a pillar of smoke. God is speaking about that time. As the Holy Spirit is poured out, it's also going to be a time of destruction. You see, friends, someone's asking, what has taken place as God's judgments came upon the cities? Joel's describing that time. While destruction will be coming, God's Holy Spirit also is going to be poured out. And as God's people who know their God, 
Ah, this is interesting. God's people who know their God are the people who receive the outpouring, the reception of the Holy Spirit. Ah, come with me to Matthew 25, and we find the same understanding. In Matthew 25, we read the story of the five wise and the five foolish virgins, the, the story, the parable of the ten virgins. And we realize that as Jesus speaks about the parable of the ten virgins, that we are told why the wise are wise and why the foolish are foolish. Verse 3 of Matthew 25, verse 3 says, they that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil. Verse 4 says, the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, in other words, the foolish are foolish because they did not take oil with them. The wise are wise because they had oil with them. Now, friends, the, the reality is God says these are wise because they had the oil. As we trace that, if you still remember our discussion on the sanctuary, we studied that this oil in scripture is a representation. We read from Zechariah chapter 4 that it is a representation of the Holy Spirit. It is awesome to know that those who are living a life filled with the oil of heaven, the Holy Spirit, are a people declared as wise in scripture. But it doesn't stop there, friends. Do you realize that at midnight there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh. That is interesting. That's the text on your screen, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 10. That's the loud cry that says to the rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the Lord God, ye people of Gomorrah, the end is near. The end is near. The bridegroom cometh. Well, friends, we realize that the five who were foolish, they had not prepared, they had not enough oil. So as they went out trying to get oil, it was too late. It was too late to get up and start looking for oil. And we realized that when the door was finally shut to the marriage in Matthew 25, 11, they come in Matthew 25, 11 saying, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But in verse 12, the bridegroom from within answers and says, I know you not. Wait a minute. I know you not. Do you realize, friends, the reason why the foolish virgins were not ready because they did not take time to know the bridegroom. They had not taken time to be in a relationship. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says a people do not know me in Isaiah. They have loosened their grip on me. Sin has overtaken them. Destruction has come upon them. And while there are people, the remnant, who are knowing me in a relationship with me while they receive the Holy Spirit and go out to prepare the broken world, appealing to them to come and listen to the word of God, there are a people who do not know me and as a result have not received the Holy Spirit, the oil of heaven. They have not known me, hence they have not received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Wow. The Lord pleads with them, come now. Let us reason together, say of the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This plea of mercy goes out, come, I want to save you, come. And to save you come now friends the bible says continues in verse 19 if you be willing and obedient you will eat the good of the land what a promise if you be willing and obedient you will eat the good of that promised land that god has prepared for them that know the lord for them that love the lord that's what the bible says eyes have not seen ears have not heard what God has prepared for them that love the Lord, you will eat of the bounties, you will eat of the abundance of that which God has prepared for you. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now, friends, some people say, oh, look, 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 God is just waiting to kill us. God is just waiting to destroy. Look, he says, if you refuse, you will be killed. The reality is, friends, you by your own sins have already paved for yourself a way to death. God is not standing there waiting to kill you. God's standing there waiting to receive you unto himself, to save you, to rescue you. 
he could care less and walk out of the out of the whole story and say fine go down that path of destruction yourself but he stands in the path and says don't go down that path come get to know me because if you don't get to know me you will receive the consequences of your own sin adam and eve you have sinned now i have come down even though you've sinned and never cared to ask for forgiveness i've come down to offer for forgiveness because the wages of sin is death and if the lamb doesn't die then you'll have to die and god says i i i, I want to save you from that i want to save you from that but if you refuse then you you take the death if you accept that all those sins are transferred over and and jesus jesus jesus's payment is more than sufficient to pay for the debt and to give you that eternal salvation but if you refuse then you will have to carry the burden the guilt and the condemnation of sin upon yourself it's like lot's wife it's like lot's wife instead of thankfully accepting deliverance she presumptuously looked back to desire the life of those who had rejected the divine warning instead of thankfully accepting deliverance and rejoicing she presumptuously she looked back and she's desiring the life of those who have rejected the divine warning you see friends her sin her looking back desiring to be a part of that destroyed a destroyed experience or it it was that sin that showed her to be unworthy of life because she had no gratitude for the preservation of life that god that extended towards her the brothers and sisters god standing in your way today god is standing in your way today saying come to me get to know me for the path where your head it is only going to eternally separate you from the lord if you refuse and rebel you will be devoured with the sword you will be devoured with the sword friends this is important isaiah 121 continues to say now how is the faithful city become a harlot it was full of judgment righteousness lodged in it but now murderers look at what has happened look at what what has happened to god's people look they've become a harlot and the reality is many have left god's church saying oh look it's become a harlot i will never be a part of a church that's called a harlot friends god doesn't stop there after saying that the church has become a harlot he says therefore say the lord the lord of hosts the mighty one of israel i will ease me of mine adversaries i will avenge me of mine enemies i will turn my hand upon thee and i will purely purge away thy dross take away all thy tin notice what god is saying i see what sin has done to my people i see what sin has done to my church and now i'm not just going to sit around and watch the church become a harlot i am going to come and purge away he says i will ease me of my adversaries there are those even within the church who are working against the cause of christ he says i will avenge me of my enemies those who are trying to misrepresent me in my church i will purge them away again be obedient come let us reason together but if you refuse and rebel if you refuse and rebel i will not allow i will not allow those who are persevering in prayer and are doing their all to be able to i will not allow them to be corrupted by your evil influence i will purge away thy dross i will take away thy tin i will restore thy judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness the faithful city the faithful city Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. Oh listen to me friends. The Bible says Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. It's not going to be easy. The redemption will come through the judgment process. Our converts will be redeemed with righteousness. But again, those that reject this, the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. Because they 
forsake the Lord, and they shall be consumed. Now, friends, again, the chapter ends with the, with, with the revelation of the ache in God's heart, with the revelation of what is tearing God apart. As he says, the transgressors and the sinners, they will be destroyed. Because the reality is they let go of him. Yes, they fell. There were times when they fell and they were led astray. There were times when they were broken and there were times when they walked away from me. But even in those moments, as they fell, they did not choose to hold on to me. They just let go and walked away. Yeah, they fell. I saw their downtroddenness and the reality was no one was more hurt than me. No one was more hurt by their backslidings and by their evil doing and by their corruption and by their evil devising. No one was more hurt than me because they were sinning against me. But it breaks my heart to see that they've let go. Why did they let go? Why did they lose in their grip? Dear brothers and sisters, we've just looked at the first chapter and it's painted for us right at the beginning. It's painted as a picture of the end. And friends, much of scripture, much of scripture is all about this because God knows the time of the end is at hand. And he's given us glimpses, chronological events that tell us that the end is near and we need to be a people that are ready to meet the Lord. You see, friends, the question today is, are you a people who know their God? It is my plea to you, friends, that you may not forsake the Lord, that you would not lose in your grip. And I don't know what it is that's making you lose your grip, but it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So whatever it is, friend, get it out of the way and hold on to Jesus. Hold on to Jesus, even if it costs you your life, hold on to Jesus. For they can destroy the body. But friends, there is a God who's able to raise you back up. There is one who is able to raise up that body to immortality. To receive a body like you've not imagined. And a strength you've never felt. I don't know what it is, friends. But whatever it is, it's not worth it. If you're struggling to know the Lord, I plead with you. Let the struggle, let the struggle continue. Struggle through it. If the battle is fierce, know that you're not alone. Jesus fights. Jesus fights your battles, friends. Know the Lord, know the Lord, and you will not be consumed. Know the Lord, friends, and you will not be consumed. Let us prepare for the end. And the preparation comes by knowing your Savior. By knowing your Savior.
that is your desire. If that is your plea for you and your family. Then kneel with me, friends, if you're able, as we seek the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for your blessings. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for not leaving your people unguided and forsaken in the dark. Thank you, Father, for even when we forsake you and loosen our grip on you, we thank you because you don't loosen your grip on us. Hold us, pick us up, rescue us, divest us of self. Invest us, we plead with your Holy Spirit, your righteousness. Help us to guard our devotional life and to be a people that are ready to see Jesus face to face. Thank you, Lord. Bless dear friends, families, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers. Save your people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.